So, our official drink of the day is is Natura. So we have a date. This is going to happen in two weeks-ish, and we have the merge. There's one good graphic. Here it is. Here's the graphic that explains the merge. And this graphic was made for certain people because previously the merge was called Ethereum 2. End result is it's not called Ethereum 2 anymore. The official product is just called Ethereum, just like the new iPhone is called the new iPhone. So here on the picture, they wanted to explain something, and they wanted to use this nice panda here to explain it. Uh, there's two different things going on. People know about staking. They know about um, this other network, the beacon chain. They know what that means. But they didn't understand how this was connected, and people were thinking that beacon chain was just going to be a separate network. That's not the case. So beacon chain is just running a proof of stake. Beacon chain is a proof of stake chain. And so at this merge event, which is coming in two weeks, proof of work will cease, proof of stake will begin, and all the existing contracts, transactions, apps, contracts, balances, MetaMask, all that stuff is gonna to continue to work with no changes required. So the only thing that's gonna change is that nobody can any longer complain that Ethereum should be illegal because it's using so much carbon. That argument just goes out the door. Nothing else about Ethereum changes. The people that staked Ether, they don't even get their Ether back. That's going to be, you know, a while. If you staked 32 Ether, then, you know, it's still staked. Well, I mean, but the, the question which comes to mind is, you know, what, what's, I see so much discussion about, you know, uh, miners continuing to mine under proof of work. Is that just all nonsense? Okay, so this is a great question. What if miners continue to mine? Huge question. So this, this question comes up with every change that Ethereum Foundation makes. Let's explain with words, not, not a graphic yet. Let's explain how Ethereum upgrades. There's, there's a network, we have a network, everything's running, and then there's a blog post comes out of ethereum.org and they say you need to upgrade and then you have to upgrade your client or you you're invited to upgrade your client every time this happens you either upgrade or you don't and uh, that's called a hard fork so every time ethereum changes anything is actually a hard fork unfortunately they kind of bury this under the fact that they name everything ethereum they don't call it ethereum two three four Every time the Ethereum is changed, it really is a new version. So we're on like Ethereum 20 by now. So that's a shame. Once proof of stake happens, hard forking is extremely disincentivized. Some people might even say it's impossible. Here's why. So we got POS. Okay, so now in the POS world, well, I guess we could do that, yeah. QS3. Now here's, here's the huge problem with the merge and proof of stake in general. We've got four and then we've got four B. This is confusing, slow me down. We got POS3, block three, now we got block four. Now Ethereum Foundation says, oh, you should upgrade again. And so they're going to have, let's say, B. This will be using some new rule. So Ethereum version 16. They're on like version 20 by now. And there's, they tell everybody, oh, we want you to upgrade to this version. OK, so if you continue minting, I'm, I'm going to answer the question later about what if you continue on proof of work. But this, the same question applied to the future is, is even bigger. So we got proof of stake 3 block three, proof of state block four, and Ethereum Foundation is like, oh, we want you to upgrade, blah, blah, blah. Now, when you upgrade, if you are on this network, if you continue on this network, you lose all of your tokens on this network. You lose them. They're gone. So every time you are staking, every time you're participating in the network, you have to choose one direction. You can't choose both. 
If anybody remembers Bitcoin Cash or Ethereum Classic, you are on both networks together. You don't lose coins on either network. If you use your Bitcoin Cash, you don't use your Bitcoin, your Bitcoin. If you use your Bitcoin, you don't lose your Bitcoin Cash. But if you use your old Ethereum that you get a month from now and POS, and Ethereum Foundation wants you to use the new version, you will lose your old Ethereum. You're gonna lose it. You only get one. This is a major change. I don't know why anybody's talking about this. This also means that if you're a government and you wanna stop Tornado Cash, all you need to do is write a letter to Ethereum Foundation and ask them to change it. And then if anybody, if this new network does not support Tornado Cash, then anybody who uses it loses all their ether on any other networks. Or conversely, if, there's, if Coinbase creates a new network and they say Coinbase Ethereum, Ethereum Coinbase without Tornado Cash, and anybody moves their assets onto that network and they validate, they lose the same assets on the official network. So this allows, your, your ether only goes to one place. So this is a huge topic. Now going back to the actual question we got, if people continue to mint on proof of work, proof of work five, proof of work six, what happens? Nothing happens. You have two different networks. So this is the last chance you get, you get to take a stand against proof of stake, or said better, this is your last chance to take a stand against Ethereum Foundation telling you when to upgrade your client. This is the last chance you get. And you can continue on proof of work and your transactions will continue there, and you won't lose anything on proof of stake. It's gonna to continue to work. So uh, you don't lose funds, you don't lose uh, ether, you don't lose, you lose nothing. What about centralization and censorship resistant? I hear about big players have most of the validators. Yes, so this is a big issue. Regarding the validators, there's less validators than POW nodes. Top beacon chain depositors by address. Lido, 33%. Coinbase, so that's the big one. Coinbase, Kraken. So between Lido, Coinbase, and Kraken, that's 50%. That is a problem. I don't know about Lido. Actually, I don't know very much about Lido. DeFi LTD, okay. Cayman Islands, okay, so one of those type of companies. So I'm gonna assume that they're not interested in following laws. If you ignore Lido Finance, and when is this? This is as of May, and you only look at Coinbase crack, so to get another 50%, it's actually pretty tough. And the fact that Lido Finance is in Caymans probably means they're not interested in following laws in the United States. So I don't actually see very much centralization risk or censorship risk currently. I mean, 51% is an issue, but even 33%, even, even if Lido themselves were in the US or in a country that was more you know, law-based, um, this could be an issue because you know, one third of transactions could be held up because of tornado cash. They might just not sign those transactions. Uh, the, you know, the other issue is that they don't sign any derivative transactions, so they might have their own like, separate side chain. That's, that's the real risk here. All right, anything else regarding the merge, POS, POS, POW fork, POS, forks in the future, any questions about that? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. So, so, so in two weeks we're gonna be, the Ethereum mainnet is gonna be proof of stake, but then some miners will still be on proof of work? Yep. Same transactions, they're compatible. Okay. So if you sign a transaction today, it is playable. It can be played on proof of work or on proof of stake. Just like back in the day, if you made a transaction, the same transaction could be replayed on Ethereum or Ethereum Classic. It could run on either until eventually they stop that by using so a chain ID. Is not on proof of work anymore. 
you're saying that the validators, the miners on POW will still get rewarded? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yes. Are they still? Yes. Okay. So on this network, on POW net, let's, let's call it that. Nobody has a name for this thing yet. Uh, let's. Palnet. Yep. We're, we're two weeks ahead of the curve. We know this is going to happen. Nobody's named it Palnet. So it's going to be continuing. So you're going to get Palnet Ether, and you're just going to get it. You're going to accumulate it. Everybody's going to start with the same balance you have today, but you will be earning on Palnet. Oh, and PS, the difficulty will go down because there's less people mining it. Critical note. So. Here's the end of the question. Yeah. Well, when you're writing it, is it is it the developer choice to choose the writing on POS or the PO, uh, W? It's not. Once you sign your transaction, any validator can pick it up. In fact. People can just watch the mempool or they can watch Etherscan on POS and play those same transactions in any order on POW. So we have a previous episode related to sandwiching. Now, this doesn't matter unless the Palnet Ether is worth something. And it might. So basically, it's going to be a different coin. Yes. Long. Yes. So in two weeks, it's going to be like, Yep. So basically, some people, some miners can rebel against the Ethereum Foundation and just keep on supporting the POW. That's right. And just, just do whatever they want with it. But there's going to be no development on it. It's going to be as it is. We'll get to that. So here, the question was, what happens when you have Ether on the other network? So is it going to be Palnet Ether? Um, when you use MetaMask and you select GorleyNet, it shows up as Gourley ETH. Now this wording isn't actually standardized, it's just, this is just the way that MetaMask decides to show it to you. Inside of Gourley Net, it's just called Ether, but they decided to brand this as Gourley ETH. Uh, when you use Robston, they call it Robston ETH. Back in the day, it just used to say ETH, which was confusing. So when you use the old version, when you use Palnet, if you're using an old client, it just shows up as ETH. Um, the rebellion. Okay, so remember, there's a huge incentive here for certain types of people to want to use Palnet. Who benefits from Palnet? Probably the ones who had the most validation. And the biggest miners, surely. The biggest miners. Scary, feel free to unmute and ask. Great job, mods. I'm just let you guys go through, go through this because William's such a great explainer. Good job, mods, keeping the, keeping the thoughts flowing. Um, the biggest miners, why? Because they have a sunk cost in mining equipment, which becomes useless after the merge, after PAL, in PAL, post. Okay, you're really close. Who's bigger than a miner? Who has more money invested in mining than miners do? Say it. NVIDIA. NVIDIA. NVIDIA has a lot to lose. I think NVIDIA too, they had the, the chip shortage, as real as that was, and they ramped up production and then you had this decrease in, in price of ETH, so you lost miners, you people selling equipment, people that were underwater, and now they, there's like a surplus. And then the source of this is I was a miner, so I watched the, the price of the, my equipment drop dramatically over the last like seven, eight months. Thank you, and sorry. Uh, so will we probably not see an incentive for, let's say, validators, which will be kind of the only hardware investment at that point on proof of stake? We won't see, you know, an incentive for them to continue validating Right. So if 
this is the answer to your question is always based on market value. So just like Ether Classic. So you might say, well, you know, what's the what's the economic incentive to validate on ETH Classic? We have math. Incentive equals, so we have uh, stake divided by total stake. So we're going to have take divided by total stake times value. That is your math in LaTeX because we're cool like that. <laughs> I love the math. <laughs> Let me get that. Math. We'll use that in the tweet. So I don't have the answer here. I mean, those, that's the formula. And then you can, do, you can, you know, you could see. I think this gets a lot, you know, this is all theoretical right now. We're talking about theory, game theory, economics, staking, future rewards, slashing. Okay, this is all theoretical. What's probably gonna happen is most people are just gonna do whatever Ethereum Foundation says. When it gets interesting is when the United States government puts a sanction on anybody who runs a validator node that approves transactions for tornado.cash. OMPS, they're publicly listed companies. OMPS, their name is Coinbase. That's when this goes from theoretical to practical. So if we're talking about game theory, is there any incentive for, or let's put it this way, what, would, what could NVIDIA do if, if we're talking about, you know, big players? What they can do to have people stay on the fork of the OW? I'll tell you right now. Assuming a video has money, so let's go look at $400 billion in video. This is a typo. Is that how much money NVIDIA has? Okay, this is a viable attack. NVIDIA spends $1 billion on the largest Super Bowl ad slash media campaign ever and says, okay, um, here's why Ethereum and Web3 are so valuable and it's more important than the carbon damage. So that's $1 billion right there, gone, burned. Second billion dollars is technology and advisors and stuff. And then what they do is the next $10 billion, they just give away to anybody who moves their application to Talnet, okay? So now all NVIDIA needs to do is spend $10 billion for the largest hackathon ever to move applications on to Palnet. That will create enough interest in Palnet that NVIDIA's stock will go up 10%, and this plan we just made makes them $30 billion. That's the plan. Basically, that and so so the hope is that 10 billion will generate also enough of new apps or at least transition apps, enough transactions to pay all of the validators to stay on POW. Yes, what Nvidia needs to do is spend enough money to get enough hype that the value of the Palnet token goes up high enough that people will want to buy Nvidia cards to mount to mine it. So a little circuitous, but. You know how blockchain works. You know, $1 million of marketing turns into, you know, $100 million of pictures of animals. These PAL assets will still exist, but as PAL ETH, they may have value for certain token holders. The ancillary asset seems questionable. So you're saying the merge will separate EVMs and Ethereum, and there won't be bridges. Separate and there won't be bridges. So in this scenario, when there's a bridge, the bridge operators have to point to do different things. Let's say that they're annotated bridges. Let's say that they're validating transactions. They're kind of a trusted bridge. Let's say it like that. In this situation, this is a good screenshot. The bridges need to manually set the other half of their bridge to the other network. And really, this one doesn't need to upgrade. So probably the other chain is already proof of stake on bridge one, because they all move a million times faster than Ethereum. So this will just be POS four, block four, and they have to manually point that bridge to the other POS network. So that means that if you have a bridge, the bridge will fail, break, disconnect something on your old PAL net. Yeah, I want to go back to the question I asked before, but so let's say we have PAL net, right? Media would probably be interested in incentivizing the development of the new versions of that fork. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be probably going to be like a new community that develops. 
Awesome point. Okay, so... So key step here is hiring a community of core devs and influencers. That's a major part of keeping PAL going. I don't know how much of the market cap of NVIDIA is based on, you know, blockchain and specifically Ethereum. It's probably, you know, a considerable part. It's not all of it. So we got to figure that out. But um, yeah, part of their budget is going to include moving that community forward. Now, here's the secret. Once it's moving, it's self-sustaining. Once anybody finds PALnet to be valuable, it's valuable. Now, the people that staked, basically there's, in theory of foundation, got people to stake. So we're looking at game theory now. We're not looking at economics or anything. Ethereum foundation got people to stake and there's X dollars. We can figure this out number, just find this number real fast. There's X dollars invested in Ethereum on POS. Now Nvidia has to spend X, not X, Y dollars. Y's gotta be on the order of X. Nvidia's gotta spend Y dollars so that people are interested in, PAL, in PALnet. Also, you know, even if PALnet's worth nothing, you should still mine it. Because the, if the way that mining works is, the less people that mine it, or the less resources you spend, the, the difficulty goes down. So you just deallocate. So you spend more mining power on you know, some other network, and you put less mining power on PALnet. You should never turn it off, because there should be some equilibrium where the price just goes down. John. Cheers, John. What's up, my guy? What are you drinking? We got Natura from Chile. So you're buying it on POS once. So you're buying it from Coinbase or whatever. And then, um, so that's not going to exist on PAL 4. That transaction, let's see, did that transaction happen? Yeah, there can be replays. Yeah, so we're assuming that the bridges are going to quote play ball. So what would, it, what would that mean for like the DeFi markets? I think what comes to mind for me. Yeah, so from from most people, let's assuming so assumption, Palnet's worth zero. It's worth pennies. So from DeFi perspective, we don't care. We don't care. You know, you can take our transaction. When you sign a transaction, you can make it. Your, you can paste it into your Twitter profile. You can play it on another network. You can put it in a Word file. None of that stuff matters. The only thing that matters is PostNet 1. Should be two. Yeah. PostNet 1, PostNet 2, PostNet 3. That's the only place where the transactions matter. And the other some ladies, they're just imitating. So that can be some people's perspective. But if NVIDIA successfully drops $10 billion in their marketing campaign and application ecosystem campaign, then that's wrong. Then we need to start worrying about where these transactions are replayed. Gotcha. So you're starting to say it becomes a trust thing of, of the blockchains who are only basing their immutability off like the last block of whatever POS did, but then they can add their own transactions onto it or replay their own transactions in whatever order. Right. So you can unsandwich, resandwich. Um, so all of the all of the MEV that works on posts, you got to do the same thing on PAL. And then, again, this, this doesn't, if PAL's worth a penny, it doesn't matter. When PAL goes to $10, $100, then it's like, okay, well, if we're spending X resources MEVing posts, we better spend X divided by 10 MEVing PAL, otherwise we're leaving alpha on the table. I'm 
speaking of like economic bridges, okay. Um, you're talking So, or just economic bridges. Lay it on me. What do you mean economic bridge? Like uh, if, they're, if you're just transferring ETH from Polygon to Ethereum. Yep. Gotcha. So that's what you mean by, by bridges down there. Yeah, so that bridge is going to work both ways. So if you're going to move from Polygon to Ethereum, then that will move to both POST1 and PAL1 because there's a smart contract made by Polygon living on Ethereum and it's going to be receptive to either one of those transactions. Got you. And so, last thing, uh, yep. still just a little confirmation of where do you think the, uh, the EVMs will fall into this, uh, into this uh, economy or, or uh, documents? Yeah, I think very likely all this discussion has been academic today and probably 80 90, 95% chance everybody does exactly what Ethereum Foundation says. They upgrade their clients and very, very few people use PAL, PALnet. I don't think NVIDIA is going to invest the $10 billion required to spin up an ecosystem dev grant over the next, you know, two weeks or four weeks necessary to, to really make a dent before they lose it. And I think this discussion will just get archived into Twitter's history of trillions of comments.